Thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this video. Have you ever seen some people in a park early in the morning doing what looks like martial arts, if martial arts was invented by sloths? Or maybe you've wondered about acupuncture and how sticking a needle in your hand is supposed to help your lungs. Or maybe you've wondered about the deep lore behind the Hadoken attack in the fighting game franchise Street Fighter, when the characters unleash an energy ball from their hands. What is this? Fire? Plasma? Although these things don't seem to be related, they all have to do with qi. And qi is of vital importance in Chinese philosophy and religion. Vital because qi has something to do with vital energy. Just as a heads up, vital energy is not really a perfect translation of qi, and in fact I'm not going to give a translation of qi in this video. Despite being so fundamental to Chinese worldviews, the term qi has so many meanings that it's virtually impossible to translate. No single English word or phrase matches it very well. Now, occasionally you'll see qi translated as breath or even pneuma, a term borrowed from Greek philosophy that tries to capture the nature of qi as something that's neither immaterial nor completely material. The scholar James Miller simply says, it is the stuff of life. But the vast majority of scholars today leave it untranslated. Even if you know nothing about Chinese philosophy and religion, you may have heard of qi before because the concept has made its way into modern pop culture, especially martial arts media, almost like a superpower. As we already mentioned, Street Fighter has established that the characters can do supernatural attacks because of an esoteric energy called qi. Though as a game developed by a Japanese company, they technically call it ki, using the Japanese pronunciation of the word. Qi is implied to be the mystic energy in the movie Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, enabling fighters to battle while flying through the air. And Qi is casually dropped as a plot point in Kung Fu Panda, as a supernatural ability you can harness. That was Qi. But what is Qi? And are any of these pop culture references accurate to what's described in ancient Chinese texts? To get an idea of what it is, let's go back to the beginning of the universe. Remember from our description of the creation of the universe in our intro to Taoism video and our yin and yang video? Back in the very beginning of the universe, the Tao was formed out of primordial chaos. The Tao then created yin and yang, from which came three kinds of qi, primal, mystic, and inaugural. All are considered transformations of the Tao associated with different realms of creation. The mystic qi created heaven, the inaugural qi created the earth, and the primal created the Tao as it exists in the world of humans. At least this is according to the text called The Command and Admonitions for the Families of the Great Tao, one of the earliest Taoist scriptures dating from 255 CE. But different Taoist scriptures give different accounts of what these forms of qi do. Some later texts teach that Lord Lao, the deified form of the possibly mythical philosopher Lao Tzu, was created by the three kinds of qi before they were distinguished from each other, and then Lord Lao separated them to create heaven, earth, and water. The scripture of the inner explanations of the three heavens describes it like an egg yolk. Lord Lao spread out the mystic, primal, and inaugural qi. Still, the clear and the turbid kinds of qi were not divided from one another, but remained undifferentiated, in the shape like the yolk of a chicken egg. Thereupon he divided and distributed the qi. The mystic qi was clear and pure, so it ascended to become the heavens. The inaugural qi was thick and turbid, so it congealed below to form the earth. The primal qi was light and subtle, so it flowed throughout the world of humans as water. Regardless of whether the three kinds of qi were created by the Tao or the Lord Lao, the scriptures agree that the types of qi combined or in some cases divided in infinite ways to create the myriad of things that exist. This means that qi is the building block of the material world and created everything in it, though it's not something you can see. It's kind of like atoms in our modern scientific understanding of the universe. But qi is also the breath of life that infuses a vessel changing it into a person or animal or even a plant. Without qi, you're just as alive as a lump of clay. And qi itself is active, always flowing between organs, between people, between all creation and the cosmos in its normal course. In this way, qi transcends the division between the physical and the metaphysical. Not that Taoists have ever cared much about that distinction. The ability of qi to circulate is extremely important because it's what creates the connections between everything and the universe. Think of the universe as a giant spider web. Qi is the silk that the web is made from, but it's also the energy that moves along the threads from one point to another. When an insect is trapped in the web and moves to free itself, it causes vibrations along the thread that affects every point connected to that thread. So too can we sense changes in the flow of qi. 
scholars called this mutual resonance. Since the time of its earliest philosophers, Chinese philosophy posited that everything in the universe is connected. Taoists in particular are very interested in these connections and how they can be used to bring balance and harmony in the universe. But that's the very big picture. Qi and how it circulates is extremely important not just on a cosmic scale, but also on the micro scale of the human body itself. The circulation of qi forms the basis of traditional Chinese medicine and wellness practices, which brings us back to those people doing the slow-mo martial arts. But before we get to that, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Wondrium. Wondrium is an online learning platform with a ton of educational video content on basically any topic you can imagine. So for example, we're about to talk about health and wellness in the context of Taoism. And if you're interested in nutrition science, you can check out Wondrium's series, Changing Body Composition Through Diet and Exercise. There are episodes on how food is digested, and what effects does nighttime eating have on the body, and there's a really practical episode on evaluating the marketing claims from the dietary supplements industry. This series is taught by Dr. Michael Ormsby. He's a professor of nutrition and exercise science at Florida State University, with a PhD in bioenergetics. And this is what I love about Wondrium. So many series are taught by actual scholars. It's like sitting in on a college class. But if you don't have the time to sit down and watch a video, you can also download Wondrium videos to watch later later offline or listen to them like a podcast. Wondrium is offering the Religion for Breakfast audience a free trial. Head on over to wondrium.com slash religion for breakfast or click the link in the comments below. Now back to the concept of qi. Taoists believe that if your qi is blocked, meaning that it's unable to circulate freely, it can become stale and can cause certain illnesses. One method that's thought to fix this is qigong a system that integrates body movements, breathing techniques, and focused intention to help properly circulate your qi in order to maintain good health. What you're seeing is a series of movements mostly developed in the 1980s, but it's based on ancient Taoist ideas about how to sustain the flow of qi within your body. Various versions of these movements have been practiced for centuries. This image here, which shows you how to move your body to maintain a good flow of qi, dates from the 2nd century BCE. It was found in the family cemetery of a high-ranking Han Dynasty official, in a place called Mang Wang Dui. Ma Wang Dui is a very important archaeological site not only because of how old the cemetery is, but especially because two of the tombs were still intact, meaning that robbers never stripped the tombs of their contents. Here archaeologists discovered the earliest versions of several important Chinese texts, like the Yi Jing and the Tao Te Ching. This illustration of qi exercises was found in Tomb 3, along with a number of other medical, proto-Taoist, and astrological works. Presumably, the fact that this illustration of qi exercises was included might suggest that the man practiced them in life, and might even suggest that his family thought he would benefit from continuing to practice them in the next life. Acupuncture works on the same principle, only instead of circulating the qi, it's designed to clear away blockages in the pathways through which qi flows, which are called meridians. This allows the qi to move freely once more. Say you have a problem with your lungs. There's no easy way to get to the lungs without cracking open the chest, but the pathway along which qi circulates to your lungs also goes through your hand, so the acupuncturist can correct the flow of qi at that point and fix your lungs, all without breaking out the bone saw. The practices of moxibustion, or burning herbs on specific points along the meridians, and cupping, placing glass jars or bamboo tubes over those same points, are also designed to clear blockages in your qi and can be practiced alongside acupuncture. Cupping received a lot of attention in the US after the Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps did it at the 2016 Olympics in Rio, where he won five gold medals. In Taoism, the flow of your qi not only determines your health, but also your lifespan and your ability to achieve transcendence or become an immortal. It's believed that everyone is born with a set amount of qi. If you don't renew your qi, it will eventually become depleted and you will wither, die, and decay, just like any other living thing. Lucky for you, it's believed that there are ways you can consume qi to stay young and extend your life, consuming it from people, plants, or astral bodies like the sun and moon. Most of these ways involve special breathing techniques combined with meditation, but some of these techniques are more exotic or maybe I should say erotic. Historically, concerns about qi and its movements in and out and all around the body have dominated Taoist sexual practices. Properly done, sex can help to balance the levels of yin and yang in the body, the primal sources of qi. Some Taoists even came up with techniques that allowed them to steal qi from their sexual partners without giving up any of their own, essentially making them sexual vampires, which would be a great name for a band if you're looking for one. 
Taoists also practiced celibacy, believing that the same ability to create life, if reversed, could be used to regenerate the body, allowing them to be forever young or at least abnormally long-lived. On a grander scale, they could nourish the embryo of the Tao, aka the potential for transcendence. So by employing specific kinds of meditation techniques, blood for women or sperm for men could be sublimed back into qi, which could be refined into pure existential qi through something called nadan, or inner alchemy which is a complex system of practices especially involving breathing techniques and visualization meditation that aim to transform the body and maybe even achieve immortality. Now, we're not going to go too deeply into this topic, but it's helpful to understand that starting hundreds of years ago, Taoists theorized that the human body could be treated as a microcosm of the cosmos. Different parts of the body were connected with specific planets, gods, and divine places. Specifically, the body is divided up into sections called cinnabar fields. The upper field was centered in the brain, the middle and the heart, and the lower in the three inches below the navel. In each of these fields is a palace where a deity lives. Like all living things, these deities need to eat. But they don't eat food, they eat chi. As you nourish these deities, they form additional chi and send it to that embryo of the Tao, which is your transcendent or immortal form. Some Taoists interpreted this very literally, and some understood it as a metaphor that helped people understand the connections between the cosmos and the body. In early medieval Taoism, it seemed like most believed there were both literal deities inside them and that they could be interpreted as representing the mutual resonance that underpins the universe. But what if you're impatient, and you're not interested in waiting for the transcendence to happen naturally as a result of regular meditation? What if you wanted a shortcut? Well, then you'd start by doing alchemy. Based on the principle of mutual resonance, if everything is connected and made of the same elemental material qi, then it should be possible to transform a mortal body into an immortal one by incorporating things that don't decay into the body. Makes sense, right? If something is immune to decay, then the qi that forms it must be a kind that's immune from decay as well. Alchemy was very popular among a subset of Taoists. The most famous of the early alchemists was a man named Gehong, who lived in the late 200s and early 300s CE. In his work called The Inner Chapters of the Master Who Embraces Simplicity, he includes recipes for all kinds of elixirs that promise to transmute a person physically into a being of pure qi, something that could travel the universe through metaphysical pathways and unify with the Tao. According to him, as your body transforms, you'll pick up various abilities that sound like superpowers. Using qi, you can restrain tigers and leopards, even snakes and stinging insects. All of them, in every circumstance, you can command them to lie down and they will not be able to rise. Using qi, you can restrain bare blades so that if you walk on them, they will not harm you. If they stab you, the blade will not go in. And even if you're distracted and you're accidentally stabbed, you can inhale qi to repair the wound. You can even survive on a single grain of rice, or heal a person from 100 miles away. And I'd say it's this facet of qi that has inspired so many superpowers in modern media. Everything from the Force in Star Wars to the Hadoken in Street Fighter. These Taoists tried all kinds of elixirs made from different substances, all in an effort to transform themselves into transcendent beings. Some of the things in these elixirs were very benign, like the mineral mica, while others were medicinal plants like kasha or cinnamon. And more than a few recipes called for magic mushrooms. But no one knows for sure whether these are the same as the psychoactive fungi that some of you know and love, though it does add a whole new dimension for those cosmic journeys that some Taoists love to go on. However, many of the ingredients were very toxic. For example, Taoists frequently used a form of mercury called cinnabar, as well as lead, which together represent yin and yang. Cinnabar also has the advantage of looking like blood when heated to a liquid, but if you heat it further, you can produce elemental mercury, a silver liquid that looks really cool. Arsenic compounds often show up in alchemical recipes as well, so you might not be surprised to hear that supposedly no less than three of the Tong emperors died from various elixirs. You'd think after the second one died they'd stop trying, but apparently the idea of being emperor for eternity is more alluring. We already touched on nadan, or inner alchemy, when discussing Taoist sexual practices earlier, but it's used in many more circumstances than this outer or traditional alchemy. Inner alchemy has the same goal as outer alchemy, but the difference is that inner alchemy transforms the substances of the body through special patterns of breathing and visualization meditation. 
The practitioner inhales chi from celestial bodies like the sun or moon and visualizes the chi within their body, mixing in specific ways and at specific places to create metaphysical elixirs, which then nourish different parts of their bodies and ultimately transforms them. But the concept of qi has transcended its role in Chinese worldviews. Here in the 21st century, it has jumped geographical and cultural boundaries and continues to resonate with many outside of China, especially in the US. Though the concept of qi is radically recontextualized for an American audience, and even commodified. For example, Gwyneth Paltrow's wellness and lifestyle brand Goop frequently mentions qi in its blog, and both Paltrow and Jennifer Aniston have been spotted walking red carpets with the telltale signs of cupping on their back. The scholar Elijah Siegler defines American Taoism as a distinct religious tradition that emerged in the 70s and 80s as Americans started to embrace Taoist-inspired beliefs and practices, but often with an ambiguous relationship with Taoist lineages or institutions. As Siegler says, some Americans identify themselves as Taoists without any institutional affiliation. These include those who have read the Tao Te Ching for school or on their own, liked the concepts enough to proclaim themselves Taoist, yet with no knowledge of Taoist history, practice, or indeed of Taoists. In other words, American Taoism is a form of eclectic, individualized religiosity. It has less to do with authoritative Taoist institutions and more to do with someone's subjective spiritual experiences. And they craft a Taoist identity by engaging in Taoist-inspired practices like qigong, internal alchemy, acupuncture, and other forms of traditional Chinese medicine, either as a provider or a patient. The concept of qi meshes well with this eclectic individualism because qi is a really good example of a religious concept deeply tied to internal states, subjective feelings about your body and your sense of self. So whether you call it qi, breath, or pneuma, qi is a vital cornerstone to Taoism, Chinese philosophy, and traditional Chinese medicine. It's believed to be the vital energy flowing through the universe and the human body, and it's believed to be the dynamic force not only responsible for all things in the cosmos, but also the interconnection of all things in the cosmos. And qi continues to appeal to people all around the world, as an adaptable concept through which many people, Taoist or otherwise, view their health and their inner selves.